Hello, everybody, and you're all very welcome to our webinar this afternoon. My name is Killian, and I am working with Midwest Series. And today's topic is on mental health, education, and employment. Is there a connection? So we're in for a really good conversation. I've got some really, really interesting panelists as well that's joining us today. Um, so the I suppose I'll just explain the format of today's webinar, some bit of housekeeping, and some of the information that we use for you for, for, the, for the webinar itself. So today's topic, we'll be looking at obviously mental health education and employment. We'll look at, is there a connection between those three? We'll also look at, is it important to keep learning new things and upskilling in our day-to-day -day lives? We'll also look at unemployment and the impact that can have on our identity and our mental health and well-being. Um, just before I begin as well, I want to give a little bit of information on Midwest Series. And obviously, this is an ongoing partnership with Mental Health Ireland. Big thank you to them also for the ongoing partnership over the last number of months for a wide range of topics that we've covered on um, the webinar series. And unfortunately, Claire from Mental Health Ireland can't be with us today on this webinar. But uh, we'll have a good conversation with the panelists that are here. And I suppose a little bit about Midwest Series. We are the Midwest Recovery Education Service. And if it's your first time, Attending one of our webinars, we cover the Midwest region, Clare, Limerick, and North Tipperary, do workshops online also, and I'll have more information on those workshops online face-to-face -face towards the end of the webinar. Uh, a little bit on housekeeping then. The format of today's webinar is one hour, um, plenty of time for a panel discussion and questions that will come in from me, the attendees. So I'm just going to share with you the Q&A button. At the end of your screen, if you're on a phone or a laptop, you should see it at the bottom of your screen. And you can preload some questions now, if you'd like, just for the panelists to answer, or else throughout the webinar, if anything, anything that the panelists say sparks a bit of conversation or a question, do put that into the Q&A button and we'll be able to hopefully be able to answer all the questions that come in as well. Um, also, this webinar is recorded and will be uploaded on our Midwest Series YouTube channel. Um, this, it'll probably be up there by the end of the week. And it's also on our podcast as well, the wellness panel and that'll be uploaded as well on Spotify and Apple Music as well, and all your good podcasting streaming service as well. So I think I covered everything. I suppose I just like to invite the panelists to turn on their cameras and unmute, and I stop the share there. So I'd like to welcome Mike, Eddie, and Yvonne. If you'd like to introduce yourselves, Mike, I'll go to you first if that's okay, and we'll get the conversation going. Yeah, thanks, Killian. Uh, my name is Mike O'Neill. I'm the manager with Midwest Series, as you said, it's the recovery education theory, uh, service here in the Midwest. And delighted to be here today. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Killian. Perfect. Thanks, William. Mike, great to have you here. And uh, Eddie, we'll go to yourself. You want to introduce yourself. Thanks, Killian. So uh, Eddie O'Shaughnessy is my name. I work under the IPS. Uh, program with the HSC uh, and with employability. So IPS stands for Individual Placement Support, and it's directly to do with employment for referred clients to the service. Great stuff, Eddie. Thanks, William. Thanks for joining us here today with your experience. Though. Hopefully, we'll have a great conversation around the area that you're working in as well. So thanks a million. And Yvonne, we'll come to yourself. Thanks, Killeen. Yvonne Lane. I'm the Lifelong Learning Facilitator. I'm based in the Paul Partnership, the local development company for Limerick. I'm employed by the Limerick and Clare Education and Training Board. And my primary role is working for the Learning Limerick Steering Group, a multi-agency group with a role in promoting lifelong learning throughout Limerick City and County. And delighted to be here this afternoon and to look at this really important topic and the linkages between education and lifelong learning, mental health and employment. Thanks, Killeen. Lovely. Thanks, Mary Yvonne. Great to have you here. Again, with your knowledge and experience as well. So it would be brilliant. Uh, we'll kick off uh, with the first question, and I'll just throw it out to the panelists. And the question is, do you think there is a connection between mental health, education, and employment? And anyone would like to contribute? I'll leave it open to the floor who wants to come in first. Yeah, I'll come in there. Um, yeah, thanks, Killian. And I suppose uh, like it is that question, is there a connection? And I suppose I've been given this a bit of thought, um, and I think it's, uh, yeah, I, it's a subjective question, you know, because I think it's really interesting. We could we could go looking for, you know, you know, evidence and peer reviews and all of that, but I suppose just for this as a conversational piece, I would have to say there's a, an emphatic yes you know, um, so, and I suppose we'll probably uh, dig a little bit deeper 
as we're going along through the webinar. So, um, yes, I think there's a strong connection. And I suppose for me, part of that is which came first? You, you know, when we look at mental illness, mental health, mental health challenges, like was it, um, you know, does unemployment come as a result of that? Or, our, you know, the lack of education, the barrier to employment and therefore can have an impact on our uh, mental health. So I think it is that um, piece that uh, it's never one thing, but I definitely think there's a strong link. Thanks, Gillian. Lovely. That's great, Mike. Uh, Eddie, what do you think? Um, uh, much like Mike, I have a very biased view on this topic anyway. So <laughs> um, I would have to say from, from the work I've been doing over a good many years, even from a start point, it always comes back to purpose. You know, what to actually to create purpose for oneself and an individual. And what is that to somebody? So you know, whether that's activity, whether it's education and training, whether it's employment, um, whether it's your own mental health and how you keep yourself well. I think all the doors are interconnected, to be quite honest with you. Even from a very young age, most young people, they have a schedule time boundaries all of those good things um and it's when they're not in place that oftentimes one or the other of the other areas kind of falls down a little bit and that can get exacerbated as time goes on so from my perspective we have a kind of a hashtag which is purpose through employment and it's i know it's a hashtag but we kind of deliver that as the basis of how we work with people as well and interconnected with that then is the whole piece around minding your own mental health within that and with education and training, I suppose my the way most where my brain works most of the time is how I can make somebody's resume or CV better, and a lot of the time that comes back to somebody that may not have worked for a period of time, or they have and they want to they want to pivot into another area, they want to use their transferable skills, but they may need some support around training and employment and that lifelong learning piece, you know. So I think they're very very interconnected. Brilliant. Really good insights there. Uh, Yvonne, what do you think? Thank you. Yes, no, I, I think I'll draw on some of the parallels, the themes that both Mike and Eddie have mentioned there. They're absolutely, the three are interconnected. And I love Mike's comment there about kind of which comes first and that they're, they're all so connected, mental health, employment, education, lifelong learning. I'm just even looking at the vision for us as a, as a Limerick UNESCO Learning City, the initiative that I work for. And it's our vision is for a vibrant region where people are living healthier so that includes our mental health happier and more productive so you you bring in that word productive in employment and, and our connection to our uh, formal job roles l more productive lives as a result of their involvement in, in lifelong learning and i suppose we like to promote lifelong learning not just kind of formal education in the formal school uh, further education and training third level sectors we like to kind of promote in limerick and through learning Limerick, that it's kind of for all of us throughout our daily life, throughout not just our education or working lives indeed, but from the cradle to the grave. And uh, it's both within our homes, within our families, our communities, and including the employment piece in, in the workplace. So if we actively engage and embrace lifelong learning in all of those avenues, I suppose it'll make us happier, healthier, and as a result, our mental health. But I, I, I was struck by your comment there, Mike, in, in relation to, I suppose, that they're so interconnected in the sense of um, unemployment can directly lead to you know, dare I say, depression, poor mental health, or, uh, you know, people, Eddie, that you're working with, your your, your clients, uh, you know, maybe suffering fr from mental health might be so encountering barriers to employment that you help them with. So I'm really excited about our discussion. Yeah, I mean, Mike, that's great, Yvonne. Uh, might delve a little bit deeper on that, but Mike is kind of, and what you touched on as well, Yvonne, what, which comes first, or is it at different stages of our life that things we might delve into education at different times or... Yeah, um, yeah. I come in there, Killian, and I suppose, again, I'll speak from my own experience, and I suppose, uh, looking back now, I am I have a lot of miles on the clock, is probably the best way to put it. But I suppose now, while I'm working in the area of mental health, through my work, it's given me a greater understanding of what my mental health uh, was like, um, through my childhood and through my adult life. And I think there was always 
Well, I've had my mental um, health challenges. I've had my diagnosis. I've had my treatment. Um, but I think I was always predisposed to, um, you know, low mood, at risk of depression. And and, uh, and, and I think it's interesting that we come unemployed. And I suppose I was an early school leaver. I didn't have a leave insert, but I got an apprenticeship. And I was a printer by trade and I worked at that for many years. And I have to say, I loved it because it was meeting a creative need in me as well. So we look at reward. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but this was one of the things that was actually keeping me well. I had a job that was supporting my well-being. And, and I can remember when the crash came in 2008 um i was out of work for a short while um and then i got back at the three day week but in 2011 i i was made redundant and i can remember that feeling of going out walking out the door i sat in the car and i cried is this where i am at this hour in my life and I went into a bit of a downward spiral. And, you know, so, and then I moved to Limerick and I thought somewhere along the way I would get a job. And, um, but there was nothing came my way. And at that point, I realized, hang on here now, if the situation is cha isn't changing, I need to do something. So I decided to get back into education. And um, so I done a level five, a level six, a level seven, and and I got back into employment. And um, so there was a gap there for a couple of years. And and I have to say I enjoyed it. But in the meantime, I was doing voluntary work, you know, because I think occupation is so important for the brain so even if you're out of work get stuck in it doesn't matter what it is join a group i was a member of south hill men's shed um for that period when i was out of work uh loved every minute of it but again it was that connection that attachment bringing in different speakers when we look at lifelong learning that was kind of the thing we done all of the time and um you know so for me that was really important um because I had no formal education as a child. So I knew that there was a gap there. I always had that sense of feeling less than. Um, and again, that was my own mental health playing tricks on me because I was comparing myself to the two others. Where's this sense of failure coming from? And um, and I said, it, but it's not easy. And um, because again, which comes first? But as I said, there was a window there for a couple of years and particularly in the beginning because not knowing how to occupy myself. And when I wasn't well, all I did, I got up in the morning, walked the roads, because I had nothing else to do, and walked and walked and walked until I couldn't walk anymore. But that's all I could do. But I joined the Hunt Museum, um, volunteered in there for a number of years. When I'm retired, I'll be going back. Uh, because again, find something that you enjoy. Look at your strengths. And that's where you go. So whether it's informal or formal education, build those connections, build those networks. You know, it's lifelong learning because, I mean, we use the phrase all the time. You know, the minute somebody might say, say something that's really helpful and you say, oh, that was a light bulb moment or, you know, every day is a school day, you know. Um, so um, so now I've probably gone around the houses to answer no. that, Gillian. No. But, um, you, you know, um, so I suppose it's kind of like, you know, it's it's what represents hope as well. And where can we get that bit of hope? And I think for other people, like in Lifelong Learning Festival, Eddie there and his role is kind of that, that encouragement that we can give to others to build their capacity and that everybody is entitled to be supported in education, training, formal or informal at any stage of whether they're in mental health recovery or just as a, as a basic human right, um, you know, which is another webinar, which I won't go in here. Um, thanks, Gillian. Lovely, Mike. Thanks a million. What rings a bell to me there was the purpose through like, you getting back into education. I know Eddie mentioned as well, purpose, your hashtag purpose through employment as well. So I think that's really, that rings a bell what you're saying there in the last couple of minutes. So that's brilliant. Eddie, I'll come to you if you have any thoughts on even what the question I posed earlier on, like which comes first or if any at all, um, what do you what do you think around it? 
Yeah, I, I suppose, again, like Mike, I, I probably have the same amount of mileage on the clock, to be quite honest with you. So I've probably done every job under the rising sun, I'd say. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, from very kind of labouring, low-skilled employment, all the way up. And it wasn't until later in life, like um, at the time before 2001, I was a water sports instructor. So I was in a very active environment and I was very fit, but it was a, a very exciting kind of a role as well. So, but it wasn't until 2001, I think, or something like that, when the foot and mouth came into the country, a um, bit of history, but uh, it, it killed the business. Do you know what I mean? And much like Mike, I all of a sudden I found myself unemployed uh, from somebody who worked every day of their life, you know, and that had a profound effect on me as well, you know. Um, so like, again, like Mike, I kind of went back into education as a way to, to better myself and see, you know, where do I go with this? And it gave me, I, I suppose it was in, I went to do my leading search in Sexton Street, uh, when it was uh, a centre there as well. Um, and that gave me the spur to actually go back into education and look at lifelong learning and like, so I went on and I done a diploma degree, et cetera, you know, and that became part of my support. So, and, and I suppose, it's having that understanding of knowing where people are coming from a lot of the time, especially in the role I'm in now, in that the people that I've met um, as uh, through the service uh, right now, they come from all walks of life. There's such a wide demographic of people from those who um, have had very traumatic uh, uh, lives for many years to those that have, for whatever reason, their psychosis has kind of come to them later in life to those who are um, suffering with depression, anxiety, a wide range of people, of diagnosis, of um, and circumstance. But underlying all of that is a basic need. Either want to be connected to something or somebody and having purpose and having a drive to do something. So for some people, they walk in and they haven't an absolute clue of what where they are, what they want to do, where they want to go. So some of that is kind of taking that little bit of time, gathering your information and talking to the person, seeing where, where they're coming from and looking at what are their positives, what are their challenges, and then seeing how we can model to the next step for them. But kind of going back to your your original question of which comes first, I think there it's a very kind of a parallel journey all the ways along because where you are in your life on your own mental health journey can have a huge effect on where you are in your work life education training uh, stream and vice versa if one gets it one is always affected by the other so they they kind of push and pull off each other i would say it is brilliant Eddie. thanks for all that information and really good knowledge well yvonne i'll come to yourself on the question if you have any additional no, no thanks yeah i have a few just reflections on, on that discussion and it's it's an interesting question which comes first and the interconnectivity between the three I suppose it's like the the phrase where you can't look after your others, you know, your family or your children or your your friends or your extended family folks, etc., unless you look after yourself properly first and put in the time for our for our self care. So I think it's it's the same. It's a similar analogy then with engaging in further education and training, lifelong learning, formal non formal learning, and employment. That I suppose our health, our mental health, that we need to focus on that as I suppose the, the primary thing. And our if if we are between jobs from time to time to time in our you know working lives or if we want to go back and, and further our own you know upskilling or or training etc that we invest in our own um broad health both I, I like the way Mike that you, you described there going you know you walked the roads etc et but I, I, I work part-time for, for learning Limerick I'm one of the lucky ones that work the equivalent of three days a week and on a Friday I meet my brother every every Friday and we, we go walking because that's his his hobby he'll walk in and so he takes me up my lesson different uh mountains and we go to UL lovely lovely walks there as well and I think just ensuring that I suppose life is busy that we have that time um to to look after our own well-being will ensure that if we want to take on that course that we're in a space to do so do you know what i mean there's no point in setting you up for, set up for a failure in in trying to do a course at, at, a, at a time where 
for one reason or another, you're not in the in the space or or the mindset or having having time to 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 do it. And equally, that's the same with the challenge of taking on new roles or positions at work, etc. I suppose just one thing that I'd like to to mention about we've 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 talked about uh, I suppose going back to further education training, which which is wonderful. But I I do want to say about the interconnectivity between the three mental health employment education that I suppose we in Learning Limerick always like to promote that lifelong learning doesn't have to be the end goal of, of a job and lifelong learning it's about engaging in in learning new things um every every day for the joy of learning or for the fun and that's why I love organizing the Limerick Lifelong Learning Festival annually in kind of the April time frame because those kind of tasters such sessions fun activities where they might give somebody a little taster of a further education course that they want to do the following September um it's absolutely fine if they're doing something just for for the fun of it and for a hobby if you like which is as which is as important in in our education and and our lifelong learning and who knows it might you know mean that we can i suppose further our own careers and and employment as well so they're just kind of some of the comments in relation to kind of which comes first or or the connections between them lovely that's great and i think just what you're talking about the lifelong learning process is great for to give that person the taste or to something that they may take on board down the line as well and I know, Mike, you mentioned about volunteering as well, another avenue for people to try something and see what they what they make of it as well. Um, I'm happy enough that you've answered the question anyway, the one there uh, really well. So I'm going to move I, on. I just, I just very, yeah. very quickly, Killian. So yeah. in in a in a fairly recent previous life, I was working under SICAP, under the Social Inclusion and Community Activation Program, and like uh, Yvonne would know, Adrian or Connell very well outside in West Limerick. Um, but I would have seen firsthand that lifelong spectrum, you know what I mean, of the different types of activities, courses, programs, etc. And again, while my role outside there was predominantly on employment, we definitely, there was lots of crossover in the type of activity that we used to do. So the, the, none of them are mutually exclusive um, in the types of training, etc. You know, but it's, it's giving people tasters of lots of different things and letting them have the decision of what they'd like to do. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, there was lots of different things that I actually even tried myself for the first time, which was, which was a bit of fun as well. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, I've just said it. Brilliant. Thanks, Mary and Eddie. And I, I'm just going to know the next question was around, is it important to keep learning new, new things or upskilling throughout our lives? I think we kind of covered that, but I want to kind of look at, are there any challenges? That you can think of with continually trying to learn or upskill or anything along the lines. What are the challenges that people face if they're trying to delve into a new course or start a new job or anything like that? Um, Eddie, were you going to unmute there? Sorry, or Mike, either one, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll yeah, come in there. I suppose. I suppose challenges is I suppose is getting it right, and I suppose when you, as as Yvonne said, there's a whole spectrum of learning. Uh, you know, purely from enjoyment and fun. You know, right up to formal education. And I suppose we're Midwest areas. We see it. I suppose we're non QQY, so that's why. So to accommodate, you know, different learning styles, different learning abilities, they're all discussion based. There's minimal written work. There's no exams at the end of it. You know, so it is about like inviting people in to discuss in an edu- an adult education space how we can improve our mental health. Um, you know, so, and I suppose like one of the challenges I know for me when I was um, out of work um, and at the time, and I don't know, so I'm giving a plug to St. Vincent de Paul, um, I didn't have the money to continue in my formal education. Uh, like Eddie, I was doing a diploma course and at the time, and I just didn't have the money to sign up. And and at the time, I know St. Vincent de Paul, they had a fund there purely to assist people in education. And um, and again, I applied for it and I was successful. I completed the course and I got back into work as a result of that. So, so I suppose it's kind of sometimes if you're looking at barriers and I suppose for me, it's reach out and ask for help. You know, because again, there's an employability office, like there's lifelong learning people out there. So if I don't have the answer, but 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 usually what happens is instinctively people want to help. So when you're confronted with a challenge or a barrier, 
ask for someone for assistance or guidance because if I don't know the answer, I'll say, you know, there's a guy up there in employability, Eddie, or I will link in with um, so somebody else and signpost and even go as far as making appointments. I mean, I would have done that recently here. Uh, a former mental health professional needed assistance with his son um, to get back into the workplace who had gone through a, a difficult period in his life, phoned me, joined the dots with employability and set, set up that, got that in, in, in motion. Now, and again, so I was gone. As soon as I joined the dots, I was gone. So practical example of, and I think people are willing to uh, assist whatever, wherever the gap may be, people are always willing to, because we're all working in the care and services. We all, so learning is about learning for ourselves, learning to help others, you know, empowering others to learn as well. So um, there's lots of ways um you, you know to skin a cat for the want of a better word um you know so but but reach out and ask i think um when you do encounter challenges super mike i know eddie you're looking to come in there yeah yeah Thanks yeah I, I suppose really for me the challenge and my kind of touch on it is is the start point what's the entry point what how do you make a connection first do you know what i mean um from for somebody who uh, even it either is not in employment or is but needs support or has been referred by entry or whatever it's that first point of entry and how do people find out about the services do you know what I mean like employability has five different uh, job coaches and they work across kind of the, the Limerick area and each county has its own employability uh, which is very important as well you know so that the employability is a nation but the employability program is a nationwide program and IPS then is specific to through the HSC so the, in, in certain areas for a more con concise support do you know what I mean so for some people it's knowing how to make the connection so is it through your citizens information is it through your local um, sidecap program your local partnership program and usually in most communities people will have an entry point of you know who can I talk to? Uh, who is in community development? You know, in your local, um, in your local, I don't know, in your local church, in your in your local community center, whatever it is, there's usually somebody who knows somebody where that that is the start point for your connection. So, the, as Mike said, it, it is asking that first question of who do I talk to. I think that's the main challenge. I think the challenge for all the agencies is making sure we're all talking to each other. Um, which is very important, um, and that we're not siloed. You know, that does good conversation across the board between kind of community and voluntary and statutory agencies. And there is a point of contact. There is a Mike O'Neill that I can talk to. There is an Yvonne Lane I can talk to. You know, that I have the phone number. I have their email. I promise I won't. Yeah, I won't be after you. But you know what I mean. But it's it's that kind of it's making sure that you know who's who and that there's good connectivity between them. Really, that's the important thing. That's brilliant. And he's making that link to help more and more people if they're who are in search for that help as well for if it's a course or education or whatever it may be. So that's great. Yvonne, had you any thoughts? Lovely, yeah. yeah. I suppose I like there about the connection and the uh, the connections between ourselves as you know, community groups, agencies, uh, education providers, uh, local development companies, and um, absolutely your your point of contact and the person that can make a difference in somebody's life through a meeting that's maybe set up or, or recommended or, or referral, like the sidecap, you know, lifelong learning workers that point, you know, signpost people and, and help people on, you know, checking out uh, education opportunities, etc., et or the adult information and guidance service of our local ETB, the education training board, etc. Whoever it is can make a difference. We had a lovely story relayed from one of our learning ambassadors, um, an initiative that we run with Learning Limerick, where the chap, uh, David, said that it was through a, attending a lifelong learning festival event in, in TUS about you know, accessing or a transition to third level um, education. It was through attending that taster session in one of our April festivals that he ended up going back and is now in first year in his social care degree this year. And I suppose it, it ties into what you're saying that, you know, a, ch a conversation, be that a chance conversation or may, um, I suppose, pr promoting opportunities w with people. Just to touch on the barriers, I think, we've it's 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 kind of been mentioned in our in our earlier discussion 
that, that that fear of failure or that I'm not good enough, those invisible barriers. Uh, okay, there's the practical ones about time, cost, venue, uh, uh, and, and so on, and getting the right direct directions and signposting. But I think that those invisible barriers about our self-esteem embarking on something cannot be underestimated. And I suppose I, I'm grappling with how do we build somebody up to ensure that they're not setting themselves up for for that, that failure or that, you know, the, the fear of failure that they may have or that they they are, of course, good enough to, to try to, to go for this opportunity. Um, and success breeds success then. And I suppose the motivation and feedback that you get from actually starting something well builds your own momentum and, and builds up your self-esteem, which is great to see. Brilliant, man. And even touching on that, what advice could you, even to the panelists themselves, what advice could you give to someone who may be lacking a bit of confidence to start something or maybe if it's a course, education or starting a new job, what what would you advise someone who is out there even watching this webinar? Mike, I know you're muted there. You want to, yeah. yeah, and and I think it's it's never one thing and I suppose like even listening to Eddie and Yvonne there and again there's all sorts of thoughts going around my head and it's kind of like even how we can impact on our identity and how we see ourselves and and sometimes we sometimes we have to change the narrative or our thinking as well how we see ourselves uh, and that's not easy um you know, because I know when, you know, when we run our workshops, we, you know, in partnership with the acute um, psychiatric service here, we're in Limerick twice a week and in Ennis twice a week. And the impact that a mental health diagnosis and being in, in, um, in an acute psychiatric unit is very much how people themselves see it. Is this it? Is this where I'm? It really impacts their identity. And I am now the depressive person. I am the the psychiatric patient, and 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 it's and and it is around that. And, uh, and you know, very often you can have people who are at a low ebb in their life, and you, you know, um, and then struggling. Where do I go now? What do I do? And there could be you throw in housing issues into that relationship issues and responsibilities, children, and all of that. And it's a massive task. And um, you know, so and it's a bit like the saying, how do you eat an elephant? Well, I suppose it's one bite at a time. So start with a little bit. And I suppose we use the chime framework here um, that underpins what mental health recovery, personal recovery looks like. And it's come up here in the trades because the C is connection. So we're talking about join groups, volunteer, attend, Limerick Lifelong Fair. That's the connection piece. The whole piece for me, particularly in the mental health services, or with friends and family if someone is struggling, is to actually, you can give somebody hope by encouragement. You can do this. Stick with it. I believe in you. Because that's not the language when someone is struggling has in their head. It's the narrative is, is I'm useless. I'm wor worthless. I can't, you know, um, you know, so it's there, other people can do that for them. The identity is, is that realization I'm more than, you know, my mental illness. That's just something that happened to me. It's not who I am, you know, when I get a diagnosis and then comes back to purpose. You know, the, the, the M is meaning and purpose. So it's a reason to get out of the bed in the morning. So it's to go to the men checked. You know, it's to do the volunteer piece of work. Or it's even to go into, I'm going to go in once a week into the library, you know, and then I may see a poster on the wall. Something is coming up, you know. And, uh, you know, so it's back to that connection. And I love the last piece here because it's the it's the word empowerment. So when we look at chime as an acronym, and if you take the middle bit of empowerment, it's power. How can I take back the power in my life? You know, how can I empower myself to get another job? How can I empower myself to move from the situation? And I, I say a lot of things jokingly, and one of them is that when I was an unemployed like that, I was devastated, but I changed the narrative in my head. Because when people would say, naturally enough, like if I was in volunteering in the Hunt Museum, what do you do? You know, and um, and then it, you don't feel great when you say, no, I'm unemployed and I'm just in here volunteering. You know, so it's kind of like, well, how, you know, so for me, it was kind of, so I jokingly said, I said, well, 
I was made on employed, you know, rather than being unemployed, I said, oh, I said, I'm out of work now, you know, um, and I'm out of work a year, you know. Um, and, you know, and I decided because I never went to university when I, you know, as a young person. So for me, so this is changing the narrative. So when you'd meet people. So I said, all these smart people, when they finish college, take a gap year. So I'm having a gap year. So change in the, you know, rather than say, oh, I'm out, I, I don't have a job. So, so and change in that conversation. Two years unemployed. Do you know what? I had such a great gap year for the first year. I decided I was having another one. And you know what? And when I get a job and I get back in the workplace, I won't be just getting a job. I'll be making a comeback. <laughs> I'll be coming out of retirement. And you say these things jokingly, but it, it, it takes the weight and the pressure of I'm not performing. I'm not functioning. I don't have functionality. I can't hold down a job, you know. Um, so so it, it's playing mind games because, like, it's our thoughts that kill us. You know, we're all in charge of our own thoughts. So unless if you have someone in your life that's putting you down and saying all the things that you think about yourself, well, they need to reconsider that relationship. But like it's our relationship with ourselves is the biggest battle. So when we talk about challenges and barriers and our mental health and overcoming those challenges. And I know I've gone off on one, but I think there's something around changing that narrative for ourselves into believing it, yeah, it will be. But I think it's important, comes back to what um, Yvonne said, even, you know, it's not all about formal education because you never know who you will meet when you network and meet other people, you know, joining clubs or groups. Before you know it, you could have a career pathway. And stuff happens like that. And you make your own look, you know. Um, thanks, Gilly. That's brilliant, Mike. Uh, there's a question similar to what you were talking about in the Q&A uh, button there. So I might touch on that because you kind of tied into it in your discussion there a couple of seconds ago. So the question is, I had an interview a few years ago and I had a gap in my CV in which I filled with a course. The interviewer didn't seem impressed from the conversation. Any advice how to overcome incidents like these? So if anyone... Eddie or Yvonne, if you want to. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I, I suppose sometimes it's around, and I suppose that's kind of nuts and bolts stuff for kind of your, your CV development and how you actually present it and stuff like that. Um, and how people actually chronologically have their information on a CV, what kind of information it is. You know, if you're, if you're, um, if you have a gap in your uh, timeline, basically, I mean, what the person did was was perfectly fine. But it, I suppose, and sometimes it's in how you present that information can have a difference. Do you know what I mean? So for somebody that may have may not have a lot of uh, work experience, well, you'll put your education to the fore, depending on the job description. I know that's a kind of a technicality piece, but that's just how you can present your information is very important. And how that happens, sometimes it's always good to get someone that has an outside perspective on how you're developing your CV. Um, it's the old adage, it's never more than two pages because it becomes a bore. It's as simple as that, you know what I mean? It's There's lots of stuff on the type of presentation that you can put on it, um, what information that it actually is. If you get to the point of actually having an interview, it's your interview preparation is very important in as well. Um, it is an old adage if you've, prepare or fail to prepare or prepare to fail it's whatever whatever way that works anyway you know what i'm saying um but it's a reality in that a lot lot of people may not know what information is actually on their resume an awful lot of people don't actually do the preparation about the company that they've applied to but also in when you're preparing for interview there's two main items to that one is the information itself around the company your information and the job description but also arriving on time so on time is always 15 minutes early it's the sights the sounds but it's preparing what are the hard questions and for that person the hard question for them was the gap in their timeline so it's having somebody that can actually do some preparation around that with you and have it now you'll never know every question that someone's going to ask you but for me if that was me sitting down with them i would say that straight away well i would see that as one of the the link questions that we need to talk about you know what i mean so that they'll have a little bit of preparation done for other people they may have loads of work experience but very little education and training so how do you manage that part of a, of a conversation 
Um, what are all your transferable skills? Have you have, do you know what they are? Are they listed? Staying positive. Irish people, by their very nature, are great at putting themselves down. They're past masters at it, and they're very bad at bigging themselves up. So it's not about being cocky. It's just about being confident in yourself. But confidence comes from from preparation. To be quite honest with you, um, so yeah. So that's kind of in that vein, I suppose. That's super, Eddie. A really thorough explanation there. So hopefully that answers for the person that asked that question as well. So that's great. Any additional thoughts before we move on to the? Yeah, uh, the, I, yeah. I would think just to be honest, you know, and just say I was out of work. But you know what? I actually did a bit of study. I done different courses for enjoyment, you know, where I actually, while yes, it was a struggle financially to be out of work, but I actually used it to enhance my skills, enhance my learning, have actually give myself a break, you know. So rather than feeling you have to say, oh, I actually had a bit of a breakdown or I ended, it's nobody's business any of that stuff and i know i'm sharing stuff here but again um yeah i i don't mind that uh, y- you know it comes with the job here um you know so again whereas like there's there's gaps in my cv if you saw it um but as eddie said it's the other stuff as well and the transferable skills but i think there's something about being honest as well um because like if there was a gap in my cv um, and they had a problem with it. Well, they shouldn't have given me an interview in the first place. <laughs> you, you know, so that's reflective of them. So the fact that anyone can even with a gap in their CV get to the interview, and I think as Eddie said, prepare for the interview. Now you've made the cut. Now you have to prove it. You, you, you know, it, it, you're going into an interview then on a level playing field. Um, so there's nothing wrong with saying I was out of work, you know, because there's not many people, I think, at this stage, you know, in Ireland or any other country is going to start, you know, if you left school at 16 or got a degree and left at 21 or 22 or whatever, you, you leave and go into the work and stay in continuous employment. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Devon, any thoughts? Or you yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just similar to, to what's been covered there, I suppose, that word stigma, you know, we often hear in the area of mental health, it's a stigma attached to, to our mental health. Whereas I remember um, somebody saying to me one time, but sure, if you had, you know what I mean, um, another health issue, if you, if you had been in hospital over, uh, you know, regular health issues, or if you... Um, indeed had a diagnosis of, uh, that was in relation to your general health, you wouldn't ne- necessarily feel that stigma. And I think it's similar to when we talk about unemployment or gaps in our CVs, which we all have, et, et cetera, or experience in, t- in today's world. Sometimes we fear that there's a, there's a stigma around that, but I think it's it's around putting that positive spin on it or changing the voice in our own heads about how we sell that to ourselves, that I had I had my routine each day when I took that lovely gap year. Um, do you know what I mean? I still got up at the same time. I engaged in lifelong learning. I engaged in volunteering in my community. I had more time to spend on myself, my family, etc. Et and if if you're positive about it, the interviewer will hopefully begin to see it in a, in a positive life with an explanation. Do you know what I mean about the activities that you were involved in? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Um, yeah, Mike, yeah, and Mike. I think ju- just in addition to what Yvonne was saying, and actually turn it into a positive, you know, that you say, like, kind of when I was out of work and that gap and where I did all of these things, it actually gave me the opportunity to reflect on what type of job I want to do in meaningful work and where I want to be. And that's why I'm here today at this interview, because, yeah, I'm really clear on my career pathway now as a result of that experience, you know. That's brilliant, Mike, because it ties nicely into the next question. It's on job satisfaction. So the question is, in what ways does job satisfaction help with improve mental health and well-being? So I'll give you a moment. If anyone, Eddie, you're on mute there. If you want to, yeah. on, thanks, William. I suppose when you kind of reflect on job satisfaction, so what are you actually getting out of it? What's the... Why am I doing all this? You know, what job am I in at the moment? And everybody does that over, you know, numerous times you know, over their life. Do you know what I mean? What am I doing right now? Is this what I want to be doing in the future? And if if it isn't, how do I change it? Do you know, um, for 
people that are on different journeys with their own mental health, with their own physical health, um, with their own circumstances, their own environment, their background, where they come from, um, all of that kind of stuff has lots of different um has lots of different effects on that question. Do you know what I mean? Um, but for me, it's a case of the job satisfaction piece for individuals is part of something that we actually explore, you know, um, and what you think you'd actually like to do. And part of that, does there is, there's lots of different types of testing tools out there that you can use. But at the end of the day, what it comes back to, your likes and your dislikes and your preferences, when you break those down into... Uh, when you are part of what we do is around goal setting for people so it's kind of short medium long term and as part of that you're kind of looking at in the short term well how are we supporting you what are we doing from a practical thing right now the medium term is you know job satisfaction can you see yourself doing this job in x amount of time whatever x is that that's individual to the person and the long term view is well you're going to for this job now what would you like to do in the future and will this support you in actually getting to where you want to go um, so for some people, it's a sharp, sharp shock and they know exactly what they want, where they want to go. And they're very uh, focused on that. And for others, they're having the clue, basically. So there's, there's, a, there's a body of work to do to actually narrow that down into, a, a, down into a goal set. And in each goal, then you action it. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of create an action around what you want to do to get to where you want to go. But job satisfaction, for some people, they just want a the job. They want to earn money. And that's the goal. Do you know what I mean? And and whatever that is for them, that's fine. For others, they want to do something that's rewarding in whatever way that is. Um, and for others, it's a case of it's a means to an end. It's whatever it is to the individual, but I think it's important to explore it because like that, it's very linked to mental health in what you're doing. If you wake up, if you're going to bed on a Sunday evening and you have a knot in your stomach because you have to go to work on Monday morning, well, it's time to do something about that. It's time to change. Do you know what I mean? And it is a case of asking the question, well, what do I need to do to change? Well, I need to talk to somebody else about that. So it kind of comes back to if you're at a point of change in your life, however that gets signaled to you, talk to somebody, let them help you with it, gain some perspective, and then kind of go from there. But I think job yeah, job satisfaction is very important. Yes, great, Eddie. Thanks a million for that. Yvonne, you're on mute there. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, that's yeah. No, that, that, that's really lovely. Uh, I think it, it's it's so important, our job satisfaction for our own well-being and, and mental health. And even I kind of personally myself, I just think that that social contact and having friends at work is, is so important. That's outside of your job role or your manager, leaders, mentors, etc. But if you have that lovely network, uh, that social network uh, um, and contact and avenue at work, um, it can, I suppose, enhance our own sense of well-being as well as our own role. But in relation then to the actual work that we do, I think um, that's fine if, if somebody is is quite happy. Do you know what I mean? As as the means to the end and and for an income, I think for for many, it's about those kind of rewards of that will motivate us. That good feedback from your colleagues, your manager, that kind of motivates you some more and gives you and more self esteem and and that and that reward. So it's about like Eddie, what you said there about looking for a role or an organization that will be a good fit for you and will, will suit you and enhance our 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 own well-being as well as giving us the all-important paycheck as well indeed <laughs> lovely thanks Yvonne Mike do you have any yeah um and I suppose satisfaction I remember I was in this job um and going back I started in mental health in 2018 and I was probably about six months into the job my line manager turned around to me and she says well Mike are you enjoying the work and I said, no. And she looked back at me and she says, what's wrong? And I said, well, I says, the environment we're working in, we're supporting people who, and some of them who are acutely unwell, and to witness that level of distress in a person's life, I said, I cannot call that enjoyment, I said. But what I will say, we're working in, an environment where there's huge challenge, but there's huge reward. 
And that's the piece that gives the satisfaction. And as as Yvonne said, you know, we click with different people, you know, we can, you know, we can create friendships, you can feel supported in the role. And I think the it's the importance as well, I think, for anyone who's struggling with mental health, like the environment you're living in, the environment we work in. You know, so it was like, as I said, I'll go back to the Hunt Museum. I loved working in there as a tour guide because that environment, a creative space, an artistic space, it is it is like a sanctuary of solace in the middle of a busy city, you, you know, and to be able to, uh, you know, enthuse doing a tour of the museum with visitors. Like, and to me, that gave, that gave me satisfaction, whereas I would describe the role I'm in now it's a different because it's that challenge and reward piece. So it's how do you measure job satisfaction? Um, and it's like, as I said, I worked as a printer and because it was it was fulfilling a creative need in me, that was, in, you know, when we look at creativity and well-being, we run workshops on that. So that was enhancing my mental health. So again, we can do things to look at our, you know, look at what we enjoy and look at our strengths. And if we can apply those into a work and role that can give us satisfaction that can be measured in more than one way, I think we'll be um, we'll be doing OK. Um, and it's just and I suppose, again, it's. How do we look at, and I suppose recovery education would be best described is because we're talking about how we, it's all about the engagement piece. So, um, you know, so it's not all about, I can do all these, you know, the, the skills training piece to get a job, but it's how do we live and enhance our lives and quality of life as well. And, um, you know, so recovery education, we say we don't do QQI, but it's what we would describe as transformative learning. So where people can learn something in a workshop that they can apply in practice that will transform their thinking, their well-being, their way of life. And that's the piece. So it's, it is very much around that's the experiential piece that comes with the adult learning approach that we have. And I remember I was facilitating a workshop in the acute unit out in Ennis a um, couple of years back. And there was one man sat at the table, a couple of years older than me, and he said, I've been using the mental health services for the last 40 years and I've been in and out of the psychiatric units, he said, in, in that period of time, many times. And this was at the end of the workshop. And he says, I have learned more in the last hour than I have in 40 years using the mental health service. You know, so for him, that was the transformative piece because we never know the intervention that we're going to have in a person's life. And sometimes we'll never capture it, you know. So that was one instance where we don't know where someone can take a piece of learning and apply it six months later, <laughs> you know. So edu so education and learning as a whole, um, it's it's endless, but it's, some, it's a fantastic resource, you know, and it's available and accessible to everybody. Um, you know, so and that's the beauty of it, um, you know, and once we can take all that learning and use it wisely to apply in our own lives, personally, professionally, whatever way we want, we can enhance the quality of our life. Um, yeah. Thanks. I'd just like to add there, Killian, and, and well, like yeah, no this, for job satisfaction and that, that it, it's so important for all of us that there's a myriad of learning opportunities because as you say there you never know the intervention that's going to click with you or give you that sense of accomplishment and raise your, your self-esteem again but I think it's important that we get to try new things opportunities lifelong learning opportunities through our employment as well if possible if we're lucky enough to do that brilliant brilliant thanks Mike and thanks Yvonne for that we just have one final question we're coming close to the end so I suppose just to wrap up, what one piece of advice would you give to someone looking to start a new course or start a new job? So one tip, one one piece of advice, I suppose. Uh, Eddie, will you come to yourself? One thing, oh God. <laughs> uh, yeah, reach out, information. That's the, the trick to the game, regardless whether it's um, education, training or employment. It's gaining information. So reach out to somebody, reach out to an organization, um, get some information and make that your start point. Brilliant. Thanks, Eddie. Mike, would you like to come in? 
Yeah, I'm going to say two things because I can't stop at one. Eddie, Eddie managed to do it. Um, so, but I would say, look at what you enjoy and then look at your strengths. And if you can build on them, away you go. Lovely. Thanks, Mike. And you on? Again, two things, just that inner voice. You got this. And I suppose the importance of networking connections because both networking connections for education opportunities, but the amount of jobs that are got through conversations, through somebody saying, do you know who's looking for somebody? Um, I'll, I'll hook you up with a meeting or an introduction. Um, keep on talking and making those connections. Brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. Well done, everybody. A great conversation. So I'm just, Mike, yeah. you want to... Clear? And I'm just going to speak about connections and networking. The four of us... In October, we were down in Bedford Row at Limerick Mental Health Week. We were just chatting on the street and this just organically arose. Let's do a webinar on mental health, employment and lifelong learning. So this is how stuff happens. So you have to make the effort. But once you start the conversation, you never know where it leads. And that's... That's the beauty of it, um, because like this webinar happened today as a result of figuring it, a conversation that like just it just happened and it was simple as that. Yeah, thanks, Gillian. It's a brilliant final message, Mike. Thanks a million for that. I'm just going to share the final slides, Mike. You can get the feedback form if you get a chance there, just to put it into the chat. It'd be great. I can do it in a second anyway. But I'm just going to share the closing slides. Um, two seconds now. So, um, so just a little bit of information on our workshops that are upcoming in December. We have three online workshops. This is the Midwest Area Online Workshop Timetable. So Tuesday, December 5th, we have Creativity for Wellbeing. The 12th of December, we have Managing Wellbeing and Mental Health Recovery. And then we have our Let's Talk Resilience at Christmas workshop on the 19th of December. So all of our workshops, you can either email me at killingit.king.hc.ie or else you can book on eventbrite, uh, midwestseries.eventbrite.ie. All of our workshops are up there online and face-to-face -face, and we'll all have workshops for the coming year, like 2024 as well, January, in the next week or two weeks on so scheduled as well. So um, this, as I was saying at the start, this uh, webinar is recorded on YouTube or will be uploaded on YouTube. Uh, you can follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There's the contact details for Mike, Margaret, and myself on the left. And um, as I was saying at the start, this is a podcast as well on Anchor FM on the wellness panel. So all good podcasting uh, services as well. And this is just Claire Flynn's uh, email and contact details if anyone wants to contact her as well. So I'm just going to stop this here. Yvonne, I know you wanted to kind of mention on the Limerick Lifelong Learning Festival as well. If you want to come in there, just talk about it. That'd be great. Thanks, Killian. Yes, I think I, I mentioned the festival that I organise annually in April timeframe next year, uh, each year. But um, it there was 160 events earlier this year, uh, earlier in, in, in April, free in all areas, all topics for all ages. But we're running the next one on the 15th to the 21st of April in next year, 2024. So watch this space and learninglimerick.ie for that one. Thanks. That's brilliant, Yvonne. Uh... That's great. And something to look forward for next year because there'll be lots of different events on that week because that's will be great. So looking forward to seeing what's upcoming as well. Eddie, are you going to come in there? No, I was just going to say very quickly that, so I suppose the IPS program is, is by yeah. referral, by referral to the HSE, but Employability Limerick, while they take most of it, they take the referrals from entry or you can call in and just have a chat with one of the employment coaches and see where you're at. So if you're looking for some advice and guidance to where to start, come into the office in 5 Mallow Street um talk to one of the coaches or get them on email get them on the phone there's a website there the whole lot so just connect and talk really is the big thing lovely thanks a million eddie we'll just i suppose we'll just keep say our final goodbyes we're just a minute to three o'clock so mike would you like to say a final goodbye and a wrap up uh yeah um and thank you and again it was just joe pop something into the q a there um you know, just so as everybody will know, it will be recorded. We will be sharing the link afterwards. Uh, Killian will be sending out a follow-up email to the attendees and a link to that recording, but it's on our YouTube channel as well, just so as everybody, you know, um, has an opportunity to look at it again or uh, look at some of our other stuff out there. So, yeah, good stuff. Enjoy this. Thanks, Killian. Yep. Yeah.
Yeah, no better. Yvonne, would you like to say goodbye and a wrap up as well? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry there. Um, yes, right. thank, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. Um, I felt uh, from the topic and the, the questions we were looking at in preparation that it would be really interesting. Uh, so delighted to participate today and food for thought for future conversations and, and webinars and working together. Lovely. Thanks, Yvonne. And Eddie, finally, come to yourself. Very same as that, Killian. I suppose even before we started, we were saying we had already picked out two or three other topics that we could have in the future. So, um, and as Mike said, as you know, once you get people talking, kind of you can't stop them half the time. Do you know what I mean? But there's some great information in 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 what we have talked about today. So I hope somebody gets something out of it anyway. So thanks very much. Lovely. Thanks a million, Eddie, and just thanks to the panelists, Mike, Yvonne, Eddie, for joining me today, and just thanks to all the attendees. Hope you enjoyed it and great conversation overall. I was just kind of the facilitator of the conversation and I enjoy just kind of doing that as well. So hopefully you'll be able to see this or pass or share this as well when it's up on the YouTube channel and more people can access what the conversation is about as well today. So thanks a million everyone. We'll see you again soon at our next webinar and that will be in January, the end of January. So see you soon. Thanks a million. Thanks, Kenny. Bye guys.